To be considered a pollutant, a chemical needs to meet three basic criteria. It needs to be harmful to human health, it needs to be harmful to the environment, and it needs to be harmful to property. There are six pollutants that the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, has identified as meeting these criteria. Ground level ozone, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, lead, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. This is NOx because it could be composed of either nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen oxide. But Mr. W will add volatile organic compounds to this list. It's not officially a criteria pollutant as listed by the EPA, but it's an important pollutant. There are many sources of pollution, but they're broken down into two big categories. Point sources of pollution are sources of any pollutant that enters the environment from one easily identified and confined place. These are things like factories, power plants, or even natural sources of pollutants like volcanoes. Non-point sources are ways in which a pollutant is released in a wide area. These are usually mobile sources like cars or boats. Many pollutants are released as a result of combustion, a chemical reaction. In a complete combustion reaction, some sort of hydrocarbon fuel, meaning a fuel that contains carbon and hydrogen atoms, react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. In an incomplete combustion, however, carbon monoxide can also be produced. Carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless gas released from cars, but can also be released from indoor sources like fireplaces and gas stoves. Further, depending on the source of fuel and what other compounds beside hydrocarbons are present, different pollutants can also be released. Coal combustion can also release mercury, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, and particulate matter. Gasoline combustion from cars can release particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, and carbon monoxide. Let's take a look at what these pollutants can do. Particulate matter is a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets. These can include dust, dirt, and soot, which is unburned pieces of material. These particles are too small to be caught by the hairs lining your nose, and instead of being brushed away, they will get stuck in your lungs or even make it into the bloodstream, causing asthma, heart attacks, and exacerbate the symptoms of folks with pre-existing heart and lung conditions. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, the molecule that carries oxygen around your body, stopping it from providing oxygen to the cells of your body. This can lead to organ damage, seizures, coma, and death. Lead is a neurotoxin that can cause damage to your brain and central nervous system. Volatile organic compounds are a large category of many different chemicals, but they can all evaporate at or near room temperature and they contain carbon somewhere in the molecule, therefore organic. Gasoline, for example, is a chemical that evaporates readily. Another common VOC you may know is formaldehyde. To make it easy, I like to think of VOCs as anything with a smell. That's a very broad definition, but it hasn't failed me. So, yes, flowers, trees, those are natural sources of VOCs. Long-term exposure to sulfur dioxide can lead to respiratory issues, but there's another special case for sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxides. A primary pollutant is a pollutant that is produced at the source from which it is released. Now, some pollutants can undergo chemical reactions to become new substances. There are also pollutants. We call those secondary pollutants. Sulfur dioxide, when it combines with water in the atmosphere, results in sulfuric acid. Nitrogen dioxide, when it combines with water in the atmosphere, produces nitric acid. When these substances fall back down to earth, we call it acid deposition or acid rain. Acid deposition can lead to the acidification of soils and bodies of water, which limits how well plants can absorb nutrients from soils and how easy it is for crustacean, these organisms with shell, it limits how easy it is for them to actually well build their shells. 
It can also erode man-made structures like buildings and statues. Now, nitrogen oxides can also lead to another secondary pollutant, tropospheric ozone. Now remember, ozone in the stratosphere is great. It protects us from the sun's UV rays. Ozone in the troposphere is a lung and eye irritant. It can cause harsh breathing problems to a sensitive population, especially those with allergies or asthma. Ozone formation begins with sunlight, causing nitrogen dioxide to break up into nitrogen oxide and a free oxygen atom. The oxygen atom can then bind with an oxygen molecule forming ozone. But what happens after is interesting. See, the nitrogen oxide can react with ozone and, well, those, all those chemicals can go back to nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. Here's where those VOCs come in. With volatile organic compounds in the air, the VOCs react with the nitrogen oxide to produce a bunch of different chemicals, which aren't really within the scope of the class. But what's important is that the VOCs stop the ozone from dissipating. This entire conglomerate of compounds, the nitrogen compounds, the VOCs, and the ozone, is called photochemical smog. Photochemical smog is common in urban areas because of the large number of cars and the amount of nitrogen oxide tends to peak in the morning because of rush hour traffic as people drive to work. All those gases remain in the atmosphere, causing ozone to peak in the afternoon as that's when we get the most sunlight. What's worse is that photochemical smog can build up due to a thermal inversion. We know that the sun's light energy is absorbed by the ground and radiated back up as heat, causing lower elevations to be warmer and the temperature decreases as you go up. But sometimes, due to wind blowing in or the geographical features of an area, there can be a layer of cold air near the ground, with a layer of warm air floating above it. And that layer of warm air acts like a blanket. These thermal inversions can result in many pollutants being trapped in lower elevations where they would, well, otherwise just float up. It's a striking visual in places that experience this. Like, you can draw a straight line outlining where the thermal inversion is occurring, and uh, that air does not look like something I want to breathe. And then there's the weird pollutant that we don't really think think about too often, and that's noise pollution. Noise pollution is sound at levels high enough to cause physiological stress and hearing loss. The sources of these are usually centered in urban areas with car noise, construction, and industrial activity creating a bunch of noise. In animals, this can be especially significant. The noise masks the sound used for mating, which limits reproductive success for many organisms. This also blocks sounds used to communicate and hunt, making it harder to survive. All this sound can cause hearing damage in animals and can cause changes in migratory routes as animals avoid loud areas like cities and places with a lot of industry. In the next video, we'll look at indoor air pollutants and discuss ways to reduce the amount of air pollutants. If I put that all into one video, this thing would be like half an hour long. So finish up those notes and I'll see you whenever your teacher assigns the next video. Go team.